Good morning, West USA. Welcome to another edition of the Tuesday morning webinar. We are broadcasting live in the belly of the beast, better known as uh, West USA Corporate. And uh, we're, man, we're moving along. We are. We're coming up to the end of the year, I feel like. We're, we're, well, more important, we've got Halloween going on. But anyways, <laughs> uh, a little sneak peek at what we got coming up this morning. Uh, we've got Todd Bernard here to give us a look at the numbers. we got Mick Bernard from the Booksbed Baker team going to give us our Mortgage Minute. And uh, my three-pack today is uh, things things a coach will tell you, a you know, business coach. What are some of the first 30 things that they're going to tell you, uh, other than maybe you should get another job done? No, <laughs> that's, uh, that's not nice. And uh, we've got Brock O'Neill, one of our top producers. He's going to stop by and share his secrets to success. And, of course, uh, don't do that with Bob. As always, if you got any questions, comments, or, or suggestions on what you would like to uh, cover or hear on our uh, weekly Tuesday morning webinar, feel free to email us at webinar at westusa. Dot com. And so with that, we're going to bring in Tom Bernard, our uh, operations officer, and what is going on in uh, the market these well, days, hello, Todd? hello, Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, we are at 55 days closed on market, uh, 2.79 months supply. Our absorption rate uh, is 35.80. In other words, we're eating 35%, almost 36% of our inventory every month. Uh, 524000 is the average list price, 338 average sale price. And our list price to sale price retention is sitting at 97.63. Uh, taking a look at inventory across the board for this past week, we're at 17146 Yeah, you didn't hear that wrong. 17000 We finally are over seventeen. I don't, Mike, you know what? You know, we're happy about that, but it's horrible. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, we should be at 30,000. Beauty is in the but eye of the beholder, Todd. Amen for that. Pending is sitting at 4376 and closed units, of course, very early in the month at 13.86. But taking a look at that, it's 10% behind where we were last month. Um, taking a look at the active days on market is sitting at 162 and our closed days, as we mentioned a moment ago, down 8% to 55. We did take 1,976 listings last week. Um, I don't include the uh, de the delayed listings when I do that because they're not active. So why would you put it under active? Uh, so there were 1,976 taken last and month. We don't, and we don't include my listings on there either. <laughs> yeah. You take listings? Okay, okay. Uh, oh, so about at, 100 per week. <laughs> price ranges uh, in green are 0 to 500,000. Uh, the salmon is 501 to almost a million, and a million and up is in the purple. Um, taking a look at the numbers on the right, you can see that, you know, obviously 75% of our inventory is under 500,000 um, and 17% of it is between 500 and a million dollars. Take a look at each of those different percentages of the total uh, inventory and units and days on market. This certainly helps you uh, when you're looking to list or purchase a property and share this with your client. And again, of course, if you do this and, and isolate it down to a zip code, a neighborhood, um, you know, then of course, this will be much more accurate on your client's behalf. But these are the kinds of things that clients, specifically sellers, uh, definitely want to see. Taking a look at the spreadsheet, um, as you can see, we took 2,000 listings the week before, 1976, so it's down. Uh, 17,146 is where we're currently at, and, and again, that's that's not bad. Um, that's actually pretty good, so we'll see how that works through the end of the month. We did take more listings the week before last, so again, obviously, we mustn't have put that many under pending. Well, here you go. It is just about the same as it was last week, the, the week before, uh, 4,376. Again, this is still a little bit below. If you slide your eyes to the right, you can see 4,600 last month, 6,400 the month before. I wouldn't necessarily, Mike, say we're going into the holidays and people are thinking about Thanksgiving yet, but I, I am. Yeah, but I will tell you that there is it, it is a little <laughs> bit slower out there. And again, the people that are doing a lot of business, you're still doing a lot of business. The people that aren't, those are the people that really uh, are slowing down. Taking a look at closed across the board. Again, a little too early in the month uh, to really start to make any uh, guesses, but the big thing is just the fact that they're 10.2% down month uh, year over year for the month of September. Um, looking down at the bottom, taking a look at average list prices uh, up to 524. We were at 526 the week before. And again, slide your eyes across to the right. You'll see we're at 528 in the middle in September, uh, 537. But if you look at the previous year, um, so this would be either any of the blue columns and you look at 2018 versus 2017, um, you're going to see that, that the, the prices have gone up about 5%, 6%. That's a good thing. So, you know, when you're working with people, when the agents are working with people, Mike, and, and the consumers, we kind of touched on this last week, but the consumers are saying, you know, oh, we're headed into a bubble and blah, blah, blah. You're not heading into a bubble when you're, when you're within the normal appreciation ranges of 4 to 7%. Uh, however, 
there is an economic reset coming. I'm not going to scare anybody, but it should have been here in September of last year. Uh, you know, just Clint and I and Nick just got back from uh, Zillow. Uh, and, you know, of course, economists that have a lot of money, Mike, they, they come up with some better uh, statistics than, than the average person. And whether it's NAR, uh, Realtor.com, Zillow, whoever it is, uh, they're basically uh, preparing right now for uh, first, second quarter of 2020. So just just something to think about. Uh, we're not going to have a real dip in the in the resale values, uh, but of course, when everything else is having a problem, the consumers don't have as much spending money. Of course, they buy less houses. So that's just something to think about uh, from that perspective. Uh, for preparation, not for doom and gloom, but just for preparation. Uh, every cycle is a good cycle if you know where the sweet spots are. Look Looking at active, sold, and uh, list price to sale price retention, you can kind of see we're sitting at 162 days. That's that's right where we need to be right now. 55, 60 days, uh, average days on the market sold. Um, so again, good market, very steady market. Um, we're just not at the point where we're you know everybody's doing a ton of business, but those of us who are doing business are actually doing a ton of business. Right. So it just just depends on your uh, your focus and your uh, what market you're working. All right, as always, Todd, appreciate it. And as yeah, always, pleasure. you can get copies of the slides on um, the dash. Dashboard later on this afternoon, and uh, you can download those and use them uh, for your convenience. All right, we're going to bring in uh, Mick Bernard here from the Booksman Baker team. Good morning, Mick. Good morning. How are you guys? Oh, uh, we're doing fantastic. All right, what is going on in as far as your perception of the market? Rates are up. Rates <laughs> are creeping up. They're continually to creep up, like we've talked about all year, and now we're actually seeing it happen. Okay. I mean, we, if you notice, we see nothing in the fours right now. Uh, a couple couple weeks ago, we did. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, everything was in the fours. Even jumbos were uh, three months ago were half a percent lower than what we're quoting right now. So they're definitely creeping up, and we'll see in a couple of slides that follow what's happening. I mean, um, the, the Fed are, is increasing rates. There's no question about that. Um, everybody's predicting higher rates. So if we go to the next slide or the next paragraph, you'll see recently the uh, Fed funds rate was increased a quarter point in the in the. Um, the verbiage following the meeting, they also said that hold hold still, we're probably going to raise it another quarter this year. So what happens? Oh, is fantastic. Bonds, Appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Exactly. Bonds react to that and uh, they're headed up. People are are buying stock. The economy is strong. That's why the Fed's raised, you know, raised their rates to try to s slow things down or keep things in check. When the consumer sees that, they say, hey, let's buy some stock. The stock market seems to be going well. Let's go ahead and sell our conservative investment. And that's what causes these rates to go higher, trying to attract more people to buy mortgage bonds really kind of that simple and so um even though you may not get the, the lowest rate that you really wanted to get if we take a look at what rates have historically I averaged over this. the last few fantastic. decades you'll see that we're still in pretty good shape right now guys right um i can remember back when i was telling my kids about when i had got a, a balloon payment on a house that we had built way back in the 80s and the rate was in double digits and it was like a seven-year balloon just to keep the rate down a little bit right and so these these rates are still phenomenal, right? When you compare it to what's happened in the past. Um, last information we wanted to, to share with you about that. So kind of a great paragraph here. Even though you may have missed the lowest rates ever, you can still get a better interest rate than your older brother or sister did 10 years ago, a lower rate than your parents did 20 years ago, and a better rate than your grandparents got 40 I years love that ago. Paragraph. That is so cool. And yeah, those so, are those are bragging rights right there. Yeah. Those are bragging rights. And so <laughs> so you might get five, five and a half right now, but uh, so way better than uh, – what, what's been available in the history all right yeah and, and i love that i love this one i mean just going back to that that yeah. one is the one that you need to reach out to mick bernard get that co-branded and maybe make a meme out of it, it says uh, don't be a baby okay <laughs> suck it up buttercup <laughs> or, or something like that but this one i would be this is exactly. this is my uh this is my social media takeaway exactly. and i would get this co-branded by you absolutely and, and combine that with what todd said earlier right i mean the the four to seven percent a year, we're seeing that as well. And so I know in the past we'll, we'll do this here, maybe another couple of weeks come up with. So what is waiting going to cost you right now that rates are up uh, probably a full percent, you know, and then uh, prices are up probably 10 percent in the last 24 months. And so that's going to cost you your clients tens of thousands of dollars. And that trend is going to continue. All right. Uh, tell, tell us about the uh, Bookspan Baker team difference. Well, let's look at the 24-7 access to the pre-qualification form. We use a system called an establish where we simply send you a link and that you can access that uh, pre-qual online. The reason why is we may have pre-approved your client up to say 400000 but they want to make an offer at three eighty. You can actually change that price to three eighty to match your offer. If the, if you go back and forth in negotiations, you can change it to three eighty five, three ninety, 390 whatever you need it to say as long as you don't exceed the maximum pre-approved price especially if you're negotiating late at night or on a weekend you can't reach one of us to change it you just go in and change it yourself really 
I right, appreciate it, Mick. Uh, great information as always. And as always, uh, Mick Bernard and his team, they are in our offices. Um, they are, I mean, outside of, uh, I think we sometimes we get spoiled. Uh, they're always, Mick's always providing us with great content, great information, great tips, but they also do a fantastic job, uh, not only getting your clients uh, qualified, but also the customer service throughout. So Mick, always appreciate all that you guys do for thank us. You, thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, all right, so I am uh, work trying to work, work this little doohickey thing, but I tell you, technology, yeah, yeah. man, it works and it doesn't work. Yeah. Technology, you know, just they say just press the button. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, that worked. Yeah, moving right, <laughs> moving <laughs> right along uh, to our three pack. Uh, as as you know, Todd, um, we we have a uh, we have a coaching program here at West USA, a fantastic coaching program, uh, and there are a lot of different coaches out there, business coaches, and, 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 you know, you can go anywhere and find a business coach, right? Uh, so what I thought we'd do a little three pack today is if you were to hire a business coach, uh, what would be some of the, the first three things that they would establish with you, uh, you being the coaching participant, and of course, them being the coach and, oh boy, that would have been close. That would have been the wrong button there. All right. First <laughs> one is they would, they would tell you, to build your team. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about a team of agents. I'm not talking about building the Todd Menard team or the Mike Weinstein team have eight agents. I'm talking about uh, your industry partners, your loan officers, your title reps, your home warranty rep. All of those people you should think of as part of your team because they are part of your team rather than just uh, going by the per going with the person that gave you the neatest little flyer. You should really take the time to interview them. Uh, sit down with each person that wants your business and find out how they can specifically help you build or how they can help you build your business and also find out how you can help them as well. But there are, there are different services. There are different things that, that each of these vendors that can provide. So you need to find out how they can help you. Uh, and then discuss their philosophy of customer service. I think this is, this is huge. Uh, I want to know, uh, you know, do you turn off your phone at five o'clock? If you're going to be my lender, if you turn off your phone at five o'clock, I, I, I got bad news for you. You're gonna, you're not gonna be my lender because you know what? I'm dealing with clients at eight o'clock at night, and I'm dealing with them on weekends. Um, what's your philosophy? Just to, and, and ask them. This is why I love this question. Just ask them. What is your philosophy on customer service? Then let them talk. I, no, so true. I think the thing here is that uh, you know, as you're building this, you, you're in business with people, and and in order to have a business relationship, you have to be in a business relationship. You both have to share, uh, you know, clientele, potential business. You should be expecting business from them as well, not just for them to pay for your services that you're doing. Right. You really need to be in business for them. Uh, but again, it, it's really, uh, you know, it, think about this. We're being attacked by these disruptors in the industry right now. And the disruptors are these people that are saying there's no value hiring a realtor. That's what they're trying to do, the homey, the purple bricks. And so by having a flyer that shows that they're not just hiring you for your commission, they're hiring you and all these other professionals that are in their areas of expertise. So when they have a specific question, they're not relying, and it's not that I'm trying to say that we don't know the answer, but there is a, an element of validity that comes with talking with someone who's a, who's mm -hmm. a specialist in their field um, and is licensed in those fields. So think about that when you're trying to build your team, um, that it's not about just, you know, and put it on your flyer, put it on your listing presentation material. When they hire somebody, they're not just hiring you, they're hiring your, your team. whole team. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's very important. Yeah. And also, and if, and if you're new to real estate, I would maybe sit down and have a cup of coffee with a top producer or an agent uh, that is more successful to, than you and just ask them, what do you expect? of your industry partners. Yes, Find out what the, their response is. All right. Number two, don't be and do everything. You can't, in this industry, you can't serve everyone. And when you are brand new, you're next thing you know, you're chasing leads all over the state of Arizona. Your second lead wants to buy a $10 million commercial building. You're trying to figure out how to do commercial. You're trying to figure out how to help somebody buy a cabin up in the White Mountains. You have no idea about how water even gets to a cabin in the, <laughs> in the, in the White Mountains. Uh, and then we're working with every type of buyer. We're working with every type of seller because we're desperate and we find ourselves trying to be everything to everyone and we can't. You can't perform every type of real estate. So you can't be and you shouldn't be afraid, even if you're new to real estate, 
don't be afraid to say no and refer. Totally. Just say no. I can't help you. This is not my area of specialty. As a matter of fact, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, I'd probably be doing you a disservice uh, by helping you here. But I've got a great contact, a member of my team, you know, per se, totally. uh, to refer them. And find find and perfect your areas of specialties. Whatever your area of specialties are, and you don't have to necessarily just have one area of specialty, but your multiple areas of specialty, and then develop a marketing strategy then around those areas. Totally. You know, there's no problem with, and this is one of the value points of what you say is you can do any kind of business. You can do property management, you can do new homes, you can do luxury homes, you can do uh, commercial. But the question I think you have to look at is, should you be doing yeah, necessarily you? each of those? Yes, things? you can, but should you be? Yes. Uh, right. You know, and, and, I'm, and if you're interested in doing those and you've never done those before, hook up with someone that's already done it, you know, split your commission with somebody else within West USA, one of our specialists, and then learn. And then the next time you go to do it, you would have that area, that at least an entry level experience to that. But in the end, think about it also from this perspective, you're going to collect a 25, 30% referral fee mm -hmm. for sending it somewhere else. Imagine if you were not only able to collect that 25 or 30 percent Mike but you were also able to be closing another deal here right another yeah, offer on that's, your area of specialty six percent or more exactly. uh, you know it's just a good good form of business so that you're not getting in the car and operating outside of your area of expertise all right and then the third thing I think a, a business coach would tell you is take time to consider your decisions don't rush your marketing and business decisions we we, we will go to a office meeting and and someone will be talking about this and next thing you know we've signed up for it and we're trying to implement it then we walk into the into an office and an agent's doing this and then we're trying to implement this without really sitting back and, and taking some time uh, to reflect and to consider if I implement this marketing strategy whether even if it's neighborhood canvassing I'm going to canvass my neighborhood uh, am I just doing what another agent's doing or am I really sitting to, setting sitting down and trying to reflect of okay what materials am I going to be putting together what's going to be on those materials what neighborhood am I going to canvas and am I taking time to, to consider these things uh, because I think that we rush decisions um, we don't take time to really consider our business decisions even when it comes down to business cards and and and, and your open house signs and your yard signs everything that you do in your real estate business is a business decision and really should take the time because that's where agents get next thing you know they don't know where their money's going because they've signed up for all of these things just because something is working for another agent doesn't necessarily mean that you should do it or it's time for you to do it and or you have the financial resources to do it you got to find out that's what works point. for you and take time to connect with other agents and ask their opinions uh, you know, find out what their thoughts are about what you're thinking about doing. What was their approach? But consider who they are. Absolutely. Okay. Talking to another brand new agent that hasn't closed a deal. <laughs> that's not what I mean by taking time to connect with another agent and getting their advice. Unless, and, and I, you know, I meet agents that come and they get into real estate and their prior life, they were marketing, marketing experts. Right. Okay. Well, you yeah. know what? That might be an interesting conversation. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, and, and again, it, it, this is one of those things where, uh, and I've always said this, especially as being a coach in the past, which is if I give if I say to somebody the way to success is through dialing the phone, uh, you know I'm going to lose eighty percent of my audience of realtors. Just but it is I brought it up. Well, it is for the people that have the ability and are willing to learn and and do that every single day. So it, in this particular one, Mike, I just want to make people aware. You can go to West USA Disc. Dot com and that's D-I-S-C, WestUSADisc.com. Take this real simple little 21 question thing and it'll give you an idea what your behavioral assessment is. And why I'm bringing this up is because I don't that's care. because you do every week. Well, but, but I don't think I do. Do I have a disc? No. But, it, but with the D-I-S-C thing, you know, you will find, you know, knocking on doors. Okay, that's a D or an I thing. But an S and a C can still be successful knocking on doors. You've just got to, like you said earlier, Mike, modify your materials yeah. think about it slow down enough to modify your materials and talk to somebody to say how can i as an s or a c go out there and have as equal mm -hmm. success as a d or an i doing an activity that initially i'm not wired for yeah so think about that yeah and what i meant about picking up the phone and, and dialing the yeah. phone i was talking about your clients and your your sphere of influence i mean totally. at some yeah. point not not, not yeah. everybody right. is just going We're to open up the work. yellow pages right. or the white pages if, if and some of you may not know what that oh. is <laughs> uh you know and, and start cold calling but we sometimes we we do have our sphere of influence we and we do have our past clients and we sometimes hide let's just face it i'm going to say we hide behind technology. We hide behind social media to connect with them. We hide behind emails and text messages to connect with them. At some point, we do have to pick up the phone, the phone. And, and say hi. Yep. All right, that's our three pack. Three things that coach that a coach will 
tell you. All right, we're going to move right along and do some announcements here. Uh, we've got our pro secrets coming up. Uh, pretty excited about this. And actually, one of our uh, speakers is going to be here today, Brock O'Neill. But this is an opportunity. Uh, and all you have to do is we're going to send you the link to this. You're going to want to go to westusaevents.com. And we got a lot of what we call our, this is our profit enhancement series, where these events are specifically designed to help you close more deals. Uh, and so our pro secrets is a very, very special event where we bring in uh, top producers. They share their area of expertise with you. They'll share for 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, and then there's a hour of or 45 minutes of Q&A. So a fantastic. And, and if you don't find the value in sitting with a with a top producer and, and hearing what top producers are doing, then I don't know how much I can help you moving forward. All right. Moving. Also, we've got this is this is fantastic. Um, okay, companies like Zillow. I, and this is not a matter of whether you like them or you don't like them or what their intentions are and blah, 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 blah. We can go all day talking about that. Um, but here's the one thing I do know about Zillow. They're sitting on a pile of cash and they've got the money and they've got the resources uh, to to in, not investigate, but research and study uh, the behaviors of our buyers and the sellers. They know the behaviors. They've got the data of your buyer, your next buyer and your next seller. And so they, they are coming to uh, to West USA in a couple weeks. And we're going to talk about the on demand consumer, the online consumer. Uh, this is a free event. Uh, and our and and Kadra Evans from Zillow. She's flying down from Colorado for this, and she's going to talk about the what Zillow has been finding as far as buyers and online buyers and so forth. So it's a free event to be able to sit and just hear what Zillow's thoughts are, take advantage of their research and the money that they've invested into it. So that is coming up. You can also register for this at westusaevents.com. Uh, we also, this one is almost sold out. So, I mean, and we're just under a month away from this. So if you want to learn the next step in Instagram, I'm actually looking forward to this because I'm on Instagram only because my 12 year old signed me up for Instagram. I got nothing. I don't know what the heck I'm doing on Instagram. Uh, so I'm ex excited about this. So, uh, so American titles, Lauren Romero is going to be here at our corporate office. Uh, spending a little bit of time with us uh, going through Instagram, what you need to know about Instagram, how to use Instagram and so forth. So you want to get signed up for that because that one literally is, I'm telling you, is almost sold out. So get signed up for it. And then uh, lastly, we do have our Entrepreneur Summit uh, coming up. Uh, and this is a this is a fantastic, fantastic event. Uh, and literally for our West USA agents, the way that we've got our, we, we I'll just be honest, we up the price for our sponsors to participate in this, uh, to be able to subsidize it. And then with West USA wanted to do a uh, half off discount. So you literally can go to this event for $5. Um, I just don't know. It's almost unheard of some fantastic, uh, speakers, including our very own Deanne Fry. Um, but we got some very, very top, you know, some top producers like Templeton Walker and Todd Smith and then Doug Hawk, uh, one of the original reality stars who's got a big radio show here in town. And of course, my very, very good friend, Pat McMahon, for those of you that go way back to Wallace and Ladmo days. Uh, but he is a uh, he's a business and idea genius. And so uh, he's willing to come and share. And then, of course, Cammie Baker and Aaron Lacey. So we got a fantastic event. So go to sixfigureevents.com. All you got to do is put a discount code WUSA. We're going to text that to you because it's uh, not actually on this uh, screen right here and get the five dollars off and we will see you on november 8th all right we've got brock o'neill brock hey and it is october breast cancer awareness month so uh look at you you got all you got all decked out for us had to wear the pink today yeah, <laughs> had to wear the pink today. All right, Brock is, for those of you who don't know, uh, Brock O'Neill is out of our Chandler office. Uh, he is one of our top producers here at West USA, has been since he started at West USA, but let's just face it, he was a top producer before he ever came to West USA. And, and Brock, you're always, uh, first of all, I, this has nothing to do with anything, but you're always willing to to give up your time uh, to to help our agents and impart uh, your information and your experiences. So, first of all, we just want to thank you for that. 
problem. All right. So your five secrets to success. So we're going to roll through these. Uh, your first one, um, and we hear this, and, and I went through your five tips. So it's interesting because they're, they're ones that we commonly hear, but uh, each producer has their own like description, their own take on it. So when you talk about communication, let's go through your communication process. How important is communication and what does communicating uh, to your client mean to you? I think communication is pretty, it's everything because you not only communicating with a client, but it's communicating with everybody involved in the transaction. It's communicating with the title company, the lender, uh, the other agent. I, I think that makes for a smooth process. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, when you get your sale, they, the clients will remember if there's something really bad. And the only way that's going to be bad is if you're, if you're not communicating and keeping things in the loop and <laughs> it, uh, it, it can be a challenge to keep the communication open. But like you said earlier, you know, having your team, uh, you know, I use Nicole McGrath, transaction coordinator, having her communicating with the title company and everything, we all work together and that, that makes everything go very smoothly for the most part. Uh, but that's a huge one. How, how do you establish, uh, uh, on the onset, how do you establish this relationship with the other agent and how important that is that to you? Because I have found in the past, uh, that's cr getting on that human level with the other agent is, is, is very imperative. And, and, and because when, and if things go wrong, it's easier to talk to somebody that you have a relationship with. Absolutely. I, it can be the difference in thousands and thousands of dollars for your client um, by not communicating with the other agent. Uh, one thing I do with them is I, I always start with a phone call. I, anytime I'm going to put in an offer, I won't put in an offer without having a phone conversation with the other agent uh, to try to feel them out, kind of see what their, you know, what their situation is, what their seller situation is. And, and, uh, and find and, out what sometimes they review, uh, re, uh, reveal yeah. stuff that they're not supposed to. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, if that, if that helps my client get a discount on, on a house or, you know, may, uh, may help them make a decision on whether or not they want to put it in the offer. I mean, there's red flags that will be put up by other agents, just having a phone conversation with them. So I think establishing that and letting them know that, you know, I am a full-time agent. I've, uh, had my fair share of transactions that I work with the transaction coordinator, uh, give them a little info on, you know, my lender and stuff like that. It gives them a comfort, uh, level that it, you know, exceeds a lot of other things that they go through. And uh, a lot of times they'll, they'll want to fight to work with you too, because they know that, you know, it will be a smooth transaction. All right. Number two, um, honesty. What does, what does that mean to you? And, and how do you, um, how does this how does this pertain to your daily business as a top producer? Um, for me, I, I I try to treat every client as if they're a family member, and they you know you want to be honest to your family members. I, I plan on seeing all my clients after uh, I close on a house with them, and I know that if I'm not honest with them, it's it's going to be you know thrown to the side, and I'll never get referrals from them or anything like that. So, and what about when you? I mean, I, we're going to all find this hard to believe. I can't imagine Brock O'Neill ever making a mistake. Um, but what happens when Brock O'Neill makes a mistake? Uh, taking responsibility and being upfront and hitting hitting it off his head because there's no such thing as a perfect career. Yeah, it, you you have to own up to it. I mean, you have to own up to it. People respect you a lot more if you own up to your mistakes. Um, hopefully, they're not too big, but, uh, you know, you kind of <laughs> damage control at that point, uh, and see what you can do to kind of make it up to, you know, make it up to your client. It happens. It's part of the, part of the industry. Um, I think the ones that kind of hide from their mistakes or, you know, it, it doesn't show well for you. And, uh, eventually the truth comes out. Yeah. And I find that if, if you're upfront immediately, yeah. even if you don't have the problem resolved, I mean, that's, that just goes back to me, communication, mm -hmm. calling your buyer and seller to say, listen, I got to be up front with you. We messed up here, but we're working on things. Yeah. I mean, they respect that at the end of the day. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of it too has to, I see agents all the time, you know, my wife works in the industry as well. And, you know, agents tend to blame others quite often, whether it's a lender, whether it's 
uh, the title company or whatnot. You know, sometimes sometimes it's your own mistake and you just got to own up to it and figure out how you can move past it. And it's that goes back to the honesty. I mean, you know, be honest with yourself, be honest with your clients. So. All right. Uh, number three, uh, creativity. Uh, talk to us about creativity. Um, I, that can go so many different directions. Right. Uh, trying, trying to be unique, trying to be yourself, uh, figure out what works best for you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not perfect by any means in this world, but I have kind of figured out my niches in certain ways. And, you know, when it well, comes take, to- take us through the process of, of how you identified your niches, the trial and error and, and, and deciding, OK, th- this is my area of specialty and then I'm going to I'm going to celebrate it and I'm going to stick with it and go for it. Yeah, it, it, the you have to try many things. I mean, I've tried I, I've tried, you know, email campaigns. I've tried, uh, you know, I haven't done door knocking but that works for a lot of people. I mean, it, everybody has a different niche. And I think for me, like just being out in front of people, uh, and talking to them and getting to, you know, gaining their trust on a personal level is I would say my niche getting to know them as people, not just as clients. Uh, I think that that would be, you know, for me that that's my number one thing is just gaining that trust on a personal level that is my niche is to, you know, have fun with it and show my, enjoy my job or career or whatever you want to say. It's a passion of mine. And, uh, you know, everybody's different though. I mean, some people thrive on open houses. Some people thrive on door knocking. It's it, everybody's different. And- well, and it's interesting when you say, because that's not something that you'll hear very often. My niche is is gaining trust and building relationships mm-hmm. with people because when we think in terms of niche, we think of okay, first time home buyers, military home buyers, uh, you know, um, you know, luxury mm-hmm. and, and 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 so forth. So I find it interesting and fascinating um, be, that you say that your niche is building relationships. And what I like about it is when you're really good at it, um, then it doesn't matter who you come across because of my, if your niche, I should say is, is building relationships with people. It it doesn't matter where you meet them and how you meet them. The fact is, is when you do meet somebody new, um, you're, you're moving in to, to build this trust and build this relationship. So how do you do that? And how, what are some of the creative ways that you do that? I think, I mean, you guys mentioned the disc assessment earlier. We've done the color code test and stuff like that. I think for me, or I guess I kind of specialize is being able to assess the situation quickly and finding a common interest with any person. I can have a conversation with anybody. I don't, I mean, I have no problem with that and finding that common interest where you can keep the conversation going. Uh, I think eventually that'll lead into real estate. And, you know, if you're talking to a stranger, you know, I, I, just closed on a house recently where I, I met him on a flight back from Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. And, you know, I just started. That's funny because uh, when I, when I, when I'm texting somebody, texting my address <clears throat> and I start typing in Phoenix, it auto populates to Phoenixville. Oh, and I'm like, that. doesn't my phone know that I live in Phoenix? Like where's Phoenixville? Problem solved, mystery solved. So I want to thank you for Phoenix that. Phoenixville, Brock. Pennsylvania. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. It's great. It's a fun place. But I mean, I, I started a conversation with a guy on the inline for the, you know, flight back. And, you know, I, I offered to help him out. Uh, he was coming out here for a job interview in Gilbert and I offered to help him uh, find places to eat and things to do. If you want to go grab a beer. Oh, I would be really good at that. Yeah, That'd absolutely. be a great job for me. Absolutely. But we, you know, we connected on a personal level. I offered, I say, Hey, here's my card. Didn't say anything about real estate. I just said, Hey, here's my card. Got my cell phone on. If you need suggestions for places to eat or just want to grab a beer, since you're coming out there by yourself, let me know. Next thing I know, I close on his house. Uh, because I just helped them out. I mean, that's, it's finding, finding that. Finding their need, yeah, finding exactly. their need. There's, that's amazing. Yeah. All right. Number four, uh, negotiation skills. You and I have really never been in a situation where we're negotiating against each other. Um, but I would find that fascinating. Uh, we have, it's just, Oh, you know, I don't even know. It's and on, I, <laughs> it's, it's on the menu, at, at whatever burger, club. Yeah. you know, we have to, we have to figure out where, where we're going each month. But, yeah. All right. What's what what <laughs> I, what I know about you? You're you're um, you're very nice on the outside, uh, and I'm not saying you're not nice on the inside, um, but you're very relational. You're you're very caring. You're 
very apathetic. You're willing to give up and help. But I do know that when it comes down to representing your buyer and or your seller, mm-hmm. when it comes down to negotiating, you're probably a bulldog and um, and all that niceness is is out the window and you're going to get the best deal for your client at all costs. And your experience allows you to really do a great job at that. Talk about negotiating. I, I mean, growing up playing hockey all my life, it's it, the competitiveness of it. I, I, I love the competition. I love the, what are those lines on the ice? I, I don't, uh, I still don't yeah. understand ho- hockey. Like, yeah. like if they blow a whistle, can't like football, they just get on a microphone and tell me exactly what happened. It's like they blow a whistle and people just do stuff and no, it drives they, me nuts. They want you to keep coming back so you can figure it out. <laughs> it's a marketing campaign, but, uh, no negotiation. I mean, I love it. Uh, that's part of the reason that, uh, I I'm still in real estate. I love the puzzle pieces. I love that every transaction is completely different. Um, and it, trying to put together a good game plan for my clients, I think is one of, I guess one of the areas I just love real estate. It can be a, a absolute pain, but putting it all together. So at the end of the day, they're, they're happy and they're, you know, they're in the right place at the end of it. That's, that's huge for me. So when it comes to that, you know, negotiation, um, my negotiation skills, yeah, you, you kind of have to be a bulldog, but you, at the same time, your main goal is to have a smooth transaction for everybody. And it's not one thing I see a lot of people do, especially a lot of new agents is there's, there's a point where, you know, there's negotiation and then there's ruining a deal for your client. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, it goes back to communication with the other agent and, You have to be able to work with them and part of working with them and being open with them is your negotiation. Yeah, you're trying to get certain things out of them. You're trying to do what's best for your client at all costs. And you you have to be able to negotiate. I mean, it's a puzzle. (laughs) How much time goes into when you're preparing an offer or you're receiving an offer of of doing doing some research and and you know knowing what knowing what there is to negotiate. I mean, I, I think that's the difference between a, uh, a a seasoned agent and an agent. Oh, well, let's just call it what it is. Not not so seasoned. Um, you know, if I'm going to present an offer, uh, I've got an idea of what could possibly be on the table. I know I've, I've done my homework. I, I no. think I know what their equity position is. I know how long they've lived in the house. I I try to when I'm communicating with that other agent. Where are they going and why are they going? And nowadays, and I, you know, I, I mean, I don't know whether you ever do this or not, but nowadays of, of, of all the information just being so readily available on, on social media, you learn a lot about people on the other side of the, well, not only your clients, but on the other side of the transaction, uh, because you want to know what, what is there to negotiate? Yeah. (laughs) I, uh, <laughs> Brock secrets are coming out now. Usually I only creep them on Facebook or something if I'm pissed at them for some reason. But <laughs> that's, uh, you know, family happened. show here, yeah. Brock. Yep. Yeah, it's okay. You brought me on here. You knew what was coming, but, uh, yeah, you do have to do your research. I mean, I think there are plenty of agents who will just go out there and go on RPR and find the number. It's like, to me, it's like going on Zillow and finding the Zestimate. And it's like, <laughs> You know, you, you have to know the neighborhoods. You have to do your research. If I'm out looking at a house with a client, I'm driving around the neighborhood too, kind of feeling, out, okay, where are my boundaries where this neighborhood changes from one dimension to another? And it, it makes a big difference when putting together your offer. Um, on the other side, um, you know, I like to call the lender when they present an offer to my, my client. I like to call the lender, kind of feel them out, see you know, what they've collected from the potential buyer. And, uh, you know, not your highest dollar value isn't always your best deal. And I think that's something to understand because, you know, there are a lot of agents who will just throw in blind offers, hoping that it'll appraise low and you're, (laughs) you know, they may back out for (laughs) crazy reasons. And how much time do you waste in that, you know? they, They may back out for crazy reasons, but if you're doing your research ahead of time and you can, figure out, you know, Hey, what's, what's the situation? You know, what, why are they wanting this house? You know, you can kind of figure out what their motivating factors are and see how, see how much they really want the house. That probably gives you a good idea how well the transaction is going to go too. All right. Last one, uh, listening. Um, I, I find that this is probably one of the areas of, of how and why agents leave, so much money on the table, uh, lose clients, 
uh, just just not taking the time to to listen because I find that if you take the time to listen to a buyer or seller, uh, they will tell you they will reveal all kinds of stuff. And if you're ignoring them, then you often find yourselves offering them things that they're not interested in, and that's a little bit irritating as well. Absolutely, yeah. They, uh, I mean, it's like going to a car lot and you ask for a little hybrid car and next thing you know I, that, that never happens with me I'm, i will never go to a car lot and ask for a hybrid yeah, car but so and then they're offering you a full-blown diesel suv or something like that and you, you have to pay attention to what the, the clients are looking for i mean they don't they don't want the runaround uh, i just had a client in town this weekend from uh, toledo ohio and they said that uh, they've worked with a lot of realtors before and that every other realtor has, when they've set up the search, every other realtor has bumped up their price by like a hundred thousand. And this is on a, you know, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar house, but they're bumping up a hundred thousand. I let them make the decision on when they are going to bump up the price. We go out, look at houses and the price range they gave me. If if uh, they're not finding something they like, then I say, hey, you know what? We may want to adjust the price or adjust the area or whatever. And you're constantly listening for you know notes that you can mental notes that you can take. Uh, but they're like, you're the first person who hasn't tried to bump up the price automatically. And then it goes back to that trust factor. They are, you know, they gain that automatic trust for you and know that you're not always trying to just get the highest, highest price house for them. You're actually listening to what they want, you know, what's important to their family, where they're looking, what they like to do, uh, on a personal level. And, you know, it goes, it goes a long way. I mean, even at the end of closing, I try to do, uh, closing gifts based on, things that I like kind of notes I've taken on, on my clients for, you know, what they like to do. So we've talked about, talked about, uh, you know, going back to the color code, you figure out what they like as people and how they, how their brain works and, you know, their closing gifts could be something completely different from another one based on, you know, their organizational, you know, factors or whatever, whatever it could be. So yeah, what you know about me, what would be my closing gift? The biggest burger I've ever I appreciate seen. that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would, I would get you a book on uh, how to explain the game of hockey. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah like a hockey for dumb. That's what you, that's what I need. Yeah. I need a hockey for dummies get book. You know, I was, I'm generally really tired on Monday mornings because I, play hockey Sunday nights, but I was suspended last night. So <laughs> okay. I, uh, okay, well, I, I'm feeling pretty good this morning. We're going to talk about that off camera. <laughs> uh, all right, Brock, I uh, appreciate it. And then you got Brock's email address up there. So if you want to find out why he got suspended, I will leave that up to you. Brock, as always, um, we greatly appreciate your time Thanks and your willingness me. to give back. Thanks. All right, Bob, help us stay out of trouble. Don't do that. Hockey. Wow. <laughs> That's like soccer. Or something. <laughs> no, really, the, the two most boring games I've ever Whoa. seen. <laughs> you want to know how I got suspended, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Say the same thing. Might, might find out real soon. <laughs> oh wow! No, Dean Becker likes the game too. Yes, he does. Uh, yeah. Okay. Some things that have been happening. Well, uh, for, first thing, how do you guys get paid? Uh, th did anybody ever think of that? Well, they do in a way, but sometimes they forget. And so they went. This one is one person. There's a in the MLS. It says that they will pay one dollar if you find them a buyer. And we had one of our agents that went out there and found a buyer for this property. Now, one day before closing, she says, oh, my God, this, does this say $1? Well, yes, it does. Didn't you check that out prior to the time that you <laughs> decided to sell this property? And they had to close on it, and she got paid $1. Isn't that amazing? So you you need to know what's happening. If it's in the MLS, you probably will get paid what it says. But you, you've, you've got to have it in your mind. What am I going to make on this? And sometimes people go out and try to sell something that's not even listed in the MLS. So you have to be sure you know where you're going with these things. 
attended a class last Friday with Michael Hofstetter, and it's one of the best classes I've ever attended. He uh, he's good at this. He he's really good at at being a teacher. So I enjoyed it a lot, and uh, got the certificate and, and renewed my license. Eighty-five days early. I wonder how does that work, but I did. Um, the other thing that I'm going to talk about is RESPA's impact on real estate agents. Well, what does that mean? What is RESPA? A lot of agents don't even know what it means. It's a Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, and it came into being in 1974. Well, I began real estate in 1973, so it entered into my uh, era right there it was all of a sudden you you got to be very careful about what you do uh it, you want to make sure that you're not um accepting things that you shouldn't be accepting such as free advertising and stuff if you're going to do business with a title company and they're going to provide the advertising and everything for co-advertising you need to pay your fair share of that advertising, whatever it might be. If it costs uh, the title company $500 to do it, and you, you're taking up half the room, you got to pay 250 And you need to have receipts to prove that you did it. Because if you ever get nailed on it, you've got to prove this stuff to what we call the FBI or something like that. <laughs> and so here's a main speaker at the Boston um nar convention a strange path to freedom i just got a couple of those books yesterday white collar professional finds inspiration and gratitude in federal prison because uh back in like 2007 2008 in through there uh a kickback was provided somewhere in there and you can't do that and so she found out she's going to have to go to jail. Uh, she was sentenced to 21 months. Uh, that doesn't seem like much time, but it's a, it's a lifetime, according to the book. The book is very, very good. I've almost completed it. I'm reading it on my Kindle. A Strange Path to Freedom, and, and she's going to be speaking. Now, she can't sell real estate anymore because her license is gone. And she was a high producer selling million dollar homes. And she was just wonderful. She had three kids and everything. And it's, uh, it's something I recommend reading this book. It'll make you think about exactly what you are doing as you're working along in this path of real estate. Well, my next book is uh, entitled too pretty for prison. Hmm. <laughs> You're, as a matter of fact, you're just perfect for a person. <laughs> you, you, you're not too pretty. <laughs> wow. Amazing, some of this stuff. Here's uh, something I've got. It says, hey, Bob, I have a few rentals that I own myself, and I'm advertising them on Zillow. Do I have to disclose I'm a real estate agent on the Zillow listings? Yep. Absolutely. When you advertise anything in real estate, you've got to disclose you're a real estate agent. So somebody reached out and was irritated with him. I said, well, be sure you put that in there. He said, I definitely will right now, Bob. I'm going to get that done. So because he owned them himself, I guess he thought he had it uh, covered there. Um, a lot of agents call me and ask about reducing commission and using their commission to pay fees and different things. We've got, we got a couple of forms in the A forms. Uh, go in there and look. And a lot of people then say, well, is that in the zip forms? Well, no, it's not in the zip form. A forms. It's on your dashboard. I've got them here in my, oh, beautiful. Ding, ding. That really <laughs> rakes you across the coast. Here's commission adjustment. This is in case you want to adjust commission in the MLS. If you're going to go back and forth that, that goes to another broker who agrees to this commission adjustment in the MLS, and then that's what you have to pay. And then there's a commission reduction form. 
that's a little bit different. That's when you want to use some of your commission to pay some fees. These uh, forms, here's the A201 and then the other one is A148. But you get those forms out and take a look at them and that, that'll uh, uh, change your commission a little bit on some of these things. Hey, Looks Bob, I got a question for you. Yes, sir. I've seen a lot of agents recently uh, asking when you're going through negotiation on a contract. I've seen a lot of agents on the selling side lately say, well, if you reduce your commission, then we can get this done. You want to talk to people on? Well, That's what I got yesterday on this. Yeah, I've seen it a lot more lately than ever before. And, you know, it, uh, well, frustrating. Th th that is something that's said by an agent, but uh, <clears throat> they, they'd have to consult with their with their client about it. But here it is, West USA Commission Adjustment, and I made this up special for these cases. Uh, this lady that I was talking to yesterday wanted to write it in a contract. I'll reduce my commission. No, this is a buyer and a seller that are dealing in the contract. If you want to do this and see if it works okay, you can speak to them of this and you can get it signed by both brokers. It's okay if you do that and then work it in, but it needs to be done uh, before the contract is struck so that it's going to work out right. You want to make sure you get this done. It may take a day or two to get the other broker to sign it and get it set up. But this is a change agreed by the listing broker and a buyer broker on a, upon successful execution of necessary contracts and everything. And you just change it right in the MLS as far as, uh, well, not in the MLS, but we're having the commission adjustment out, outside of MLS in our particular one case. Contrary to the stated commissions paid by our broker on MLS entry number and dated so and so on property at so and so, the compensation shall be changed to BB, and then you put a number in there, whatever that might be. But this, yeah, it comes up. It comes up. It's something like you said, Brock. You you speak to the other agent prior to the time, and you kind of got a clue what's going on in there. Mm -hmm. And if this needs to be done, then you need to get it done before the contract is really put together because this has to be workable. But you as a listing agent can't ask the buyer's agent to reduce their commission, can you? That's not part of the negotiation unless they volunteer to no, reduce their commission. No. That's what I've seen a lot lately. Uh, no, no uh, that, that that's bad. The commission is right there in the MLS and you need to accept that. If you don't accept it, even if it says $1, then don't do it. Just don't do it. Uh, go to a different listing or something. Uh, but one of the things about it, if your client wants to buy this house and the commission is $1, do you have to show it to him? Yep, you got to show it to him. He wants to look at it. He's your client. So... But you can, though, in that event, before you show them the house, you can call the listing agent and say, I have a buyer that's interested in the house. Will you be willing to pay more of a commission? You can do that, and then you can do this commission adjustment. Uh, it's A201. It has to be done prior to submitting the offer. Yeah. Get these things stacked up. But so many of them wait until, you know, D-Day, and then they want to, or C-Day. Commission day, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Um, we got something coming up here about uh, uh, things that are going on and on. Um, well, it, it's uh, cyber security is what it is. They've got a big uh, program going on over here uh, next week, but this is at Severar. And Nikki Salgat, the attorney for NAR, will be coming, or not NAR, but AAR will be coming and doing an hour and a half class. So we're going to go down there and take a look at that. That should uh, have some interesting points. If you want to get into property management, you do have to do certain things. And I've got the information here in my hands. Uh, David Pruitt sent it over to me 
uh, become a member of the National Association of Residential Property Managers. That uh, entails a lot. So you, if you're going to become a property manager, you need to know what's on this list. And so you can uh, send me an email, brokerbob at cox.net, or even bob at westusa.com, and it'll get to me. Now, the buyer contingency addendum has changed as of October. Does everyone know that? I hope so. Get in there and get a fresh one and look at it. Now it's two pages long. Before that, it was a page and part of another page for signatures, and it it really was a lousy form. I hated it. Now, this new one, I still hate it, but it's better. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> seller's acceptance of a backup contract and everything. There's, there's different things. There's a full two pages here, but it has changed. And be aware of that and use that form. There's another one that just came out. Well, it didn't just came out, uh, come out, but... Uh, the cure period notice was changed in June, and some folks don't know that yet, but it, it, it's everything is the same except it now has says and AAR vacant land lot purchase contract. There's a cure period for that too. So you want to have that and make sure you're using the right one. Some of the agents get this stuff put in there in their forms and everything, and they don't uh, change over. Perhaps they don't know it. The, uh, oh, here, here's a good form that you ought to have. Go to Arizona Realtors, brings you standard forms. So AAR and standard forms is where you find this. All of the forms that are in there that are on zip form, you can take a look at them here, and it tells you what they're for. 